Welcome back to the Anchored Podcast, the official podcast of the Classic Learning Test. My name is Soren Schwab, VP of Partnerships here at CLT, and today we're joined by Winston Brady. Mr. Brady is the Director of Curriculum and Thales Press at Thales Academy, a network of classical schools with campuses in North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and South Carolina. A graduate of the College of William and Mary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and the Keenan Flagler School of Business at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Winston writes at the intersection of history, politics, and culture, as seen through the lens of classical wisdom and virtue. Winston is also the author of a recently published novel called Inferno. He lives in North Carolina with his wife, Rachel, and their children, and we're so delighted to have him on Anchor today. Welcome, Winston. Soren, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. It's always always a pleasure to have a good friend on, on, on the show. Uh, we're going to talk about your work at, at Thales Academy. Uh, we're going to talk about your new book that I just I just finished a couple of days ago, and it's fantastic. Uh, but as we always do, uh, we start the Anchored Podcast by talking about our guests' own educational journey. So talk to us a little bit about your, your K-12 journey. Where did you go to school, and, and, and when and how did you fall in love with kind of the classical liberal arts? Oh, I was born in Washington, D.C., and grew up in the suburbs of Northern Virginia, so Vienna, Virginia, Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. Uh, my dad's an, uh, an economics professor, and so for a short time, he taught at Sweetbriar College. And so my formative years, like four through eight, I got to spend on uh, really a very beautiful part of the Virginia Piedmont. We moved back up to Northern Virginia when I was about eight years old. And then in middle school, I transferred to a, a private all-boys school called the Landon School. Um, it's in Bethesda, Maryland. And there I was so blessed. I was so privileged to, to receive a classical education. So seventh grade, I started taking Latin. Uh, we read through uh, really the kind of curriculum that they have is very similar to what you and I are really familiar with uh, working with, with classical schools. So ninth grade, you know, we read uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, we had uh, ninth grade uh, reading uh, like a survey of great literature. Uh, we read the Iliad, the Odyssey, uh, the works of Shakespeare, Dante's Inferno, John Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, I was just so, so blessed to have an education really founded on the great books of the Western canon and having really, really good teachers that could lead a really engaging and fascinating discussion about these works and why these works were so relevant. So I love uh, I love reflecting back on these unique points in my own educational journey. Um, we talk about in classical education, like a classical renewal movement, it's something mm -hmm. that we're bringing back, something that was uh, lost for a long time in mainstream American culture. You know, up until the 1920s, education really was classical education, uh, reading great books, discussing those things. You read uh, civics tests from like the 1910s or even just like an eighth grade, like exit exam, right? Yeah. right? <laughs> or a uh, high school entrance exam. And the questions on there are things that I don't think uh, the vast majority of adults could answer these days. Like, it's just so hard. Like, the rigor and the content that people were expected to master uh, back at the turn of the 20th century is just astounding. But on, on the flip side of that, there are pockets in the United States, really great schools that still have this commitment to classical education. They, they tend to be some of those more uh, affluent and highbrow private schools, you know, New England boarding schools, schools in the New York area and the DC area. So, the education that I got is something that, you know, people like you and me, teachers at Thales, uh, other like-minded classical schools, it's an education we're trying to make available to the to as many people as we possibly can. Uh, but I, you know, just happened to go to a school that really valued those things. And so in that way, I was just insanely blessed to have, you know, taken these tours through the Western canon. I think if I could put a moment on it, it would be my sophomore year. Um, uh, my, if I could put a moment on it, it would be my junior year of high school. Uh, I went with my mom to tour the College of William and Mary, which is the school I ended up going to. But I uh, skipped the tour because on the way down, I decided to to read the Iliad in its entirety. You know, a lot of high school English classes, you read excerpts, right? Yeah. You skipped book two of the Iliad and the catalog of ships. Well, I, I reread it in its entirety. And I just, I was so uh, fixated 
on Homer's uh, poetry. It was the, the Fagel's translation, and he does a marvelous job and how he brings uh, Homer's poetry alive. But uh, book five, when Diomedes is fighting Aphrodite and Ares, uh, there was something about the imagery in the conflict, both in the wider Trojan War and what I feel are kind of like the, the symbolism of what's going on there, a Greek warrior striking out against these uh, personifications of, you know, uh, vice and, and warfare, all these uh, terrible things that afflict mankind and bring sorrow down upon us. There was just something amazing about that. So uh, I actually skipped the tour and finished reading the book. Uh, yeah. I ended up going to William Mary anyway, but it's kind of a funny story in that, um, you know, this moment where I really was uh, fixated by, uh, captivated by a really, really good book. And uh, as opposed to, uh, Reading books like that, I, you know, long story short, I really struggled with depression from like middle school onwards. And so reading works like, you know, Milton's Paradise Lost, Homer's Iliad, Dante's Inferno. Um, and as a, when I became a Christian in my sophomore year of college, uh, reading the Bible, it's those sorts of works that really helped me to deal with my depression in a much more productive way uh, than other ways that I had attempted to deal with it. Um, it allowed me to get out of my circumstances right, to not fixate on all the things that were seemingly wrong with my life and point me towards something transcendent and good and beautiful. And also that my own struggles were really not all that dissimilar to the struggles presented in such great works of literature. Um, obviously, I'm not a Greek warrior or a Florentine poet, but a lot of the struggles that those those characters go through are eerily similar to struggles that I, that I have on my own. So, uh, there was just something like comforting and epic about uh, an education founded on the great books of the Western tradition. So I just yeah, I just kept going with it. No, amen, brother. Absolutely. And and we'll talk a little bit more about about kind of your own life and, and how that inspired uh, your writing of of the Inferno. Uh, you know, I have a lot of guests on the podcast that are kind of more like first generation of the classical renewal movement that, that you alluded to. And uh, what's interesting is that the vast majority of them did not receive a classical education themselves, right? And that it's something that they later on learned about and then looked back and said, oh, my God, I wish I had had this education. But now I feel like we're getting this this next generation, um, including yourself, right, That's that has themselves experienced the beauty of a classical education and is now working hard to make sure that that is accessible to to many, many students, which, which leads me to uh, your work at, at Thales Academies. And I cannot... I, overstate just how impressed I've been with with Thales. I remember I started at CLT in 2018 and one of my very first trips as a CLT employee was actually down to uh, Thales Academy. There was a professional development and I got to give a little talk and, and meet the teachers. And I think at that point you only had three or four schools, maybe yeah, if, if yeah. at that. Yeah, if at that. And, and now on the K-12 side, I mean, you have um, so many different campuses um, in, in different states. Uh, so tell us a little bit about about Thales Academy and then your work as as curriculum director and um, and and of course your work at, at Thales Press. Oh yeah, well we'd love to have you back, Soren. I mean the door is open at any one of our campuses for you to come back and visit. We'd That'd love awesome. to have you. Yeah. yeah. So Thales Academy, we're a network of private classical schools. We have uh, around 12 campuses in the Raleigh area. So the small towns outside the city of Raleigh, um, we have campuses in many of them. Um, we also have campuses outside of Richmond, Virginia, Nashville, Tennessee, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and more campuses coming on board each year. Um, as far as like the value proposition that we offer to parents, um, we emphasize a low cost model. So it's a private school, but it's really geared towards um, individuals, parents that may otherwise send their, their students to the public school down the road for those parents that want um, an education that's more in line with their their values, or they just love the content that they're going to get in a classical education, uh, Thales Academy is here to provide that option. So our tuition is around $6,000 to $6,500 a year, and we uh, operate in states that are relatively friendly to school choice initiatives. So there mm -hmm. are scholarships available in North Carolina to attend the Thales Academy. Um, the low cost model is I really, really, I feel like the the differentiating factor between Thales Academy and a lot of other uh, classical schools that are also doing really, really good work in this space. 
Um, our founder, Bob Luddy, is the owner of a, a very successful kitchen equipment company called Captive Air. And ironically, none of the Thales Academy uh, campuses um, have a cafeteria. None of them have a kitchen. It's one of the things that I love pointing out to parents on tours. Um, you'd think that we would have an absolutely amazing kitchen, uh, given the fact that the company that our founder uh, owns produces very high quality, you know, HVAC, kitchen hoods, fire suppressant systems and the like. But a kitchen like that really isn't in the best interest of the parents who are providing the tuition to send their mm. students to Thales. Um, I mean, I think kitchens are wonderful, but there are a huge expense as far as the equipment and the personnel, the inputs, the insurance, and those sorts of those sorts of costs are, are passed on to the parents. Um, so rather than uh, you know, just trying to bring education down to the bare bones essentials of what a student needs to learn and thrive in the world today. We want to focus on everything that's going on in the classroom. So we do offer like an iPad initiative to students. We do offer like a range of like awesome clubs and activities like debate and robotics and science Olympiad and the like. But we just try to look at everything as the value that we're offering to parents. We want them to get the highest quality education at the lowest lowest possible price, highest quality education for the students, lowest possible price for the parents who are sending their students here and entrusting us with their most precious resource, their students. Yeah. It's and just to interrupt you for one sec, it, it, for our listeners, um, Jeremy interviewed Bob Luddy on the Anchored podcast. It, it, it's a while ago, but if you kind of scroll through all the podcasts uh, and kind of talking um, you know, about Captive Air and, and his general philosophy, I mean, he is such a, an incredible entrepreneur but also understood in the business world, the need for more students that are classically and, and liberally educated. And so uh, if y'all can go back and listen to that, it was, it was a really, really interesting, interesting episode. Um, but yeah, Winston, talk to us a little bit about, I guess the, um, you mentioned kind of the, the bare bones, right? But, but, but maximizing kind of the education that the students are receiving and they are receiving a, a classical, not a classical Christian model, right? But a, sorry, a classical Christian education, but a classical education in a private school. How would you say that does that maybe look different from, from some other, other schools, um, you know, that, that, that utilize the classical model? Yeah. Well, I, um, in regards to our philosophy and our outlook, I would say that we're philosophically religious. We ground our instruction on the Imago Dei and the idea that people are made in God's image. And mm -hmm. from that relationship being created in God's image, that endows human beings with an inherent value in dignity, something that can never be taken away. Um, removed from them. It is the same sort of language that's outlined in the Declaration of Independence. So we do make a, uh, a great emphasis on the influence of that idea on the American experiment in self-government and how the uniqueness of the United States is really grounded on that, that same relationship, that same principle. So with uh, that idea of being philosophically religious, I would say it's kind of like um, I haven't, uh, I've never set foot on Hillsdale's campus. I've met a lot of Hillsdale graduates. And while Hillsdale is more overtly Christian than other institutions, I, I feel like they tried to present a very big, uh, uh, relatively large tent for students that are attending there. Yeah. Um, they uh, emphasize uh, philosophical inquiry, scholarly discussion, rigor, research, and uh, to, towards answering the most important and pertinent questions of life. And we really emphasize that same thing. But the answers to th those sorts of questions there often derive from a profoundly uh, religious and faith-based context. And I, in my personal opinion, being a Christian, the answers to those questions are most profoundly and sublimely answered um, arising out of the quick Christian worldview. In that sense, though, uh, we're not affiliated with a, a Christian church or a Protestant denomination. We're not a member of like the Diocese of Raleigh or anything like that. We are largely independent in that way. Mm -hmm. We try to ground um, our instruction on this on this principle of man being created in God's image. And from that relationship, that's where we get our rights, our dignities and our values from. Um, I think a couple of ways that I try to bring this out in a unique fashion um, director of curriculum. What my job is, is to write um, textbooks, readings, present PowerPoint lectures and things like that, as well as uh, training and coaching and modeling for teachers. Uh, for some of the classes that we have, I've written the textbooks for those classes. Mm -hmm. So my favorite one, my favorite one, 
logic and writing. So mm -hmm. we have a, a logic class in 10th grade and uh, having taught logic for a number of years, you have to find meaningful primary sources to read alongside with the students. Um, something that pairs really well with whatever concepts and logic that they're covering. And uh, with this particular textbook that I put together, I paired uh, readings from Aristotle, from Plato's Euthyphro and the Republic, uh, Descartes' Discourse on Method, as well as like John Locke, the Second Treatise on Government, Montesquieu in the Spirit of the Laws, the Federalist Papers, and it ends with Frederick Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. The kids start in the allegory of the cave and they end with The Road to Serfdom while getting a thorough grounding in the practice and study of logic. But throughout that particular textbook there, I try to use syllogisms that hits on some of these big picture ideas, you know, being philosophically religious. So you know what the famous syllogism is, right? Like all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is immortal. That works really well to illustrate the nature of a syllogism, you know, three propositions, three terms joined together in such a way that the two premises lead to the conclusion. Um, the one that I like using is all animals are creatures who rule by force. All people are animals. Therefore, all people are creatures who rule by force. Mm -hmm. And throwing that out there, there's something not quite right about that syllogism, right? Like, it doesn't seem to be like a meaningful conclusion is not that people, you know, are creatures who settle their disputes by force. If we look out in the natural world, though, I mean, isn't that the way that animals settle all of their disputes? Mm -hmm. You know, lions, gazelles, like who ends up winning that fight? Always the... <laughs> Always, always the lion, even squirrels, if they come across the same acorn, you know, they're going to fight probably with their very fluffy tails. But with uh, humans, you know, we're really not at base animals. We have many characteristics in common with animals. And indeed, when people, you know, are behaving very badly, we say that they're acting like animals. The Bible has a number of examples of uh, people and their pride and arrogance that the Bible describes as acting more like animals. It's not like they transcend to some higher plane of being and said they really are just acting like beasts of the field and so on. So if you look at that syllogism there, the one of the premises, you know, all people are animals, that is uh, a proposition that many people in the United States accept, perhaps without thinking that it's true, you know, that people are at heart animals. You know, there's nothing really special about us. You know, we're just uh, we're just primates at heart. But if you follow that proposition to its logical conclusion, then uh, it really opens up to a world of difficulties, you know, settling our disputes by by fighting and arguing just an endless series of power dynamics, strife and conflict. And I'm trying to show to, you know, show students, you know, really the flip side. If human beings are not created in God's image, but, you know, they're we came about through random processes, time and chance, you know, according to Darwinian evolution, uh, some of the conclusions drawn out from that proposition are not good and yeah. aren't really the type of world that we want the students to live in. So that's kind of some uh, some of the big picture ways that we, we deal with that particular issue there. Philosophically religious, the most profound questions in life um, arise from and are really answered by this this broad Judeo-Christian tradition that we're trying to present to students, but we don't present like, you know, it's not, um, I should probably end it there, but, you know, we're trying to present to students uh, the, you know, the great debates concerning what makes life worth meaningful and mm -hmm. presenting them with, with options, arguments, you know, as to what is most conducive for human flourishing and really trusting that the results are going to work themselves out in the end, right? We're just trying to play at seeds for students in order to figure out the best ways that they can organize their lives for themselves um, and, you know, trying to point them towards things that are transcendent, that are good, that are beautiful and that are true. And, you know, it, me as a Christian, leaving the results to God to do with what he will. Yeah. Wow, I mean, it's really, really beautifully said, Winston, and, and and I'm just nodding and smiling the entire time, and but also wondering, you know, I mean, what what students are receiving at Thales, you know, most college students are not receiving anymore, right? Because we've we've forsaken, you know, even the study of the study of logic, and it's this buzzword that keeps on coming back is critical thinking. But just listening to you and and how you approach that class, like, what better way for students to become critical thinkers, right? than by 
studying logic, right? And studying the great books. And that's just something that, unfortunately, progressive education, they still talk about critical thinking, but they've forsaken, forsaken everything else. And so I'm really, really grateful that, that Thales Academy is bringing that back. Um, and, uh, and really, um, I think that's even one of your taglines, right? Is like creating critical thinkers or forming critical thinkers. Um, yeah, our so mission, it. high quality education at the lowest possible price while cultivating people of excellence through the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we don't have as much time to talk about about the, the, the Yas Prize, but I, I, I want to congratulate Thales Academy um, because you, uh, you were recognized as a semi-finalist um, for the really prestigious uh, Yas Prize, which is probably the most prestigious educational uh, uh, award that that you can win, and um, so just give us kind of a a quick snapshot of of what the prize is and and how Thales was recognized there. Yeah, so the Yas Prize uh, delivers educational grants, prizes to schools, uh, uh, to schools that are producing really game changing outcomes for their students. Mm -hmm. uh, Thales Academy this year, we're in the top 1% of all the organizations that submitted applications uh, to be considered for the Yas Prize. We made it to the semifinalist round, and we are so grateful to be recognized amongst such a such a wonderful pool of really dedicated teachers and principals, administrators, educational professionals. Um, and uh, for one, it's really encouraging to be recognized, right? I think it's you know it's uh, the, our school was founded in 2007 in the corporate offices of Captive Air, and now we have over 6,500 students. And just to have that sort of national stage to be recognized for like mm -hmm. all of this hard work that countless individuals have put in is uh, wonderfully encouraging, both to me and to the organization as a whole. But also it's encouraging to be on a stage with so many like dedicated professionals that, you know, in their particular city, their particular context, their particular group of students, they're also doing that exact same thing, trying to fill the hearts and minds minds of students with good things. You know, mm -hmm. it's very easy to fixate on all the things that are bad out in the world. You know, the news tends to bombard us with uh, all of the problems that are afflicting society, and those problems are great. But there's also all those unsung heroes in classrooms across America that are doing their best to give students high quality education. And so just to be with those individuals, learn about their stories, their organizations, network like that, you know, Soren, we, we all need more friends. And so yeah. to be on a stage like that and make friends with, with, with teachers who have that same sort of heart for their students, like we have for ours, huge privilege. So yeah. uh, my uh, hat goes off to, to Josh Herring, a friend of mine, friend of yours, uh, that, you know, represented our institution at uh, the Yas Prize events, uh, just, you know, just blown away by all of the, the accolades, the praise for just all the good things that we're doing as a school and as an institution. So it's just yeah, huge. And it's, it's really a marvel. I mean, it, and it's in the Oscar Prize, I mean, it recognizes innovation as well. Yeah. Right? And, and, and not only you were, were recognized, um, our friends at, 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 at Optima Academy, Erica Dons and her team for some of the innovation in classical education and, and, and virtual reality with the ER sets. Uh, and so two institution of classical education made it to the semi the semifinalists. So that also shows on a national stage, right, that that uh, they recognize just the genius behind. Um, and, and I remember, Winston, you were you were at a CLT event. You were graciously joining us uh, in West Palm Beach earlier this yeah, year. Graciously and joining West Palm Beach. Yes, that's, that <laughs> know, was so right? much fun. Yeah. February, I know it was March, March in Palm Beach. I know we really had to twist your arm there. Uh, <laughs> But we afterwards we were talking and saying, wow, there, there is so much innovation in classical education, right? And and you know when you look at all the stereotypes about classical education, they're just conservatives and this and that, and not really what we think about when it comes to innovation, right? It's usually like progressivism is all about innovation. But what's happening in this space, uh, and and we've had many many podcasts with 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 kind of leaders in that in classical education that have been really really innovative, whether it's bringing the cost down, right? Uh, finding different ways to deliver classical education on the curriculum side, it just makes me really hopeful for for the future of our our nation. Uh, I want to I want to turn the page here uh, and talk about your talk about your book, and I want to talk about everything. We don't have time to do that, and we don't want to give the whole book away. But but I am so riveted, um, and I just finished it a couple of days ago, and uh, now my wife just started reading it because it's it, it is really 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 good. Um, you, you, your first novel, it's called The Inferno. And uh, a lot of our uh, 
listeners are probably like Inferno. That sounds like Dante, and that is not not accidental. Um, and so, uh, but it is a novel, not not an epic poem. But but kind of to start us off, give us. I know it's going to be hard, but give us like the thirty second like spark note version of 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 the Inferno. Uh well, and thank you so much for your kind remarks. I, I'm so humbled just as an author and all the, you know, there's, it was a work of quiet desperation, you know, very early in the morning, uh, writing before I went off to work, you know, years of that, a long time in the process. So just to hear that somebody likes it is uh, just uh, very, very encouraging. So thank you so much, Soren. As far as a 30 second elevator pitch, the Inferno begins with the framework of Dante's Inferno integrated with J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings and John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress to explore uh, three themes, the problem of evil, the rise of, of big government statism, and man's need for a savior. So the story follows a, a college sophomore named Evan as he journeys through hell, uh, through the inferno, and interviews people who are condemned in various realms and regions of the inferno. Uh, through these conversations with various individuals who are there, um, Evan learns what it means to repent. And then at the end of the story, um, he gives his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, recognizing that that's really his his only hope to escape from such a realm. Wow. So that's yeah, my 30 no, second elevator pit. No, that is a well, I mean, if you're not excited to read this by now, that, I don't know what's going to grip you. But, um, you know, you mentioned you mentioned earlier, you know, kind of your own your own uh, background and, and that you that you struggled with depression. So. For the, for the reader that starts kind of even in chapter one, you meet Evan. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are some semi autobiographical uh, aspects of 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 this. So uh, if you, if you don't mind sharing kind of uh, some of your own uh, own story and and kind of how that inspired you to to write this book. Well, and um, so uh, some of that may need to be like edited out. My little uh, verbal clutter there. Um, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of biographical elements in the book, uh, things taken from my own life, as well as uh, efforts on my part to make the story more universal and accessible. Mm -hmm. um, the first chapter opens up, um, Evan wakes up in a dark wood, very similar to Dante, and uh, the reader finds out very quickly that Evan has just attempted suicide. And so having uh, grown up in outside of Washington, D.C., you find out a lot of details about his life. Um, he talks about his struggles with alcohol addiction and drug use and just this incredible sorrow uh, that he feels in his life because of, um, you know, structural problems in his personality, uh, because of the way that alcohol just really continued to rob him of joy and to fill him with shame after, you know, bad things that he had done, as well as struggling with the loss of, of his sister who had died from leukemia. Um, Many of those elements, principally the alcoholism and the drug use, are honestly things that I struggled with um, through mm -hmm. high school. And uh, this is no fault of my parents. This is no fault of the schools that I attended. I do want to make that clear. This is this is all on me. But in high school, I, I did struggle with alcohol. So uh, binge drinking on weekends that progressively got worse. I didn't realize it at the time, but you know, I felt this this massive hole in my heart. You know, I felt this uh, massive uh, loss of meaning, and that you know things just don't really seem to be important. And I really fell in uh, with the kind of a very common uh, drinking culture that is pretty popular amongst high schoolers today. Uh, the binge drinking got progressively worse as I as you know my depression kind of uh, like led me to really trust in uh, in alcohol as some way of like bringing me joy, which you can't mm -hmm. find at the bottom of a bottle. Um, you know, the more that you feed the beast, the more that you feed your addictions and your vices, really the more control that they have over you, the more you feed the beast, the more food the beast demands. And these sorts of self-destructive behaviors and tendencies tragically uh, led to me attempting suicide in my sophomore year of college. At that point in March of 2007, I, I felt as if there really wasn't any hope for me and that if I continued down this path, I was just going to get worse, you know, like getting arrested more often, bringing more shame on my family, you know, getting in more trouble and that there really wasn't any hope for me to change. I had some experience of Christianity 
you know, going to uh, church when I was very, very young. I had some semblance of like Bible stories. In all sincerity, though, the real experience of Christianity that I had came through my classical education and reading mm -hmm. Dante's Inferno, reading Milton's Paradise Lost, and then just checking out the footnotes to various passages in the Bible that these poets were referring to. In my suicide attempt, though, like having decided, resolved to go through with it, uh, believing that the solution to my temporary problem was a permanent end to my life, you know, believing that nothing would happen when I die, that I would just be bundled up into a void, that nothing would happen, I wouldn't have to face judgment for my sins. I, you know, decided to go through with this plan to fake a car accident. I drove uh, well outside of William & Mary where I attended school and I was going to fake a car accident, crash my car in the woods. And, you know, there too, like William & Mary, great private school, two parents still together today, you know, good family structure. You know, it's just a tragedy the way that these sorts of, uh, of harrowing depression just come upon a person and lead them to believe that the best thing that they can do is take their own lives. It's just, it's a, it's a tragedy. I think today, 132 people commit suicide each day, giving up on the hope for a better future in this way. It's just, it's just horrifying. In the car though, I recognized that the non-existence of God was just too convenient for me. That, you know, the, the little that I knew about Christianity, you know, I was really hoping that God didn't exist because in that way, I wouldn't be judged for things that I had done. And to me, it just didn't seem like that was plausible. You know, it's just too convenient an idea and too convenient an idea. And so I tried to repent and the opening lines of the Inferno, where Evan says that, you know, God would be just in sending him to hell and that it's just too late for a sinner like him to repent. Um, those were the last words that I said before I crashed my car, before I swerved very sharply to the left in order to send my forerunner careening off into the woods in Charles, uh, Charles City County, Virginia. Um, I was, uh, you know, the Lord graciously heard that prayer and gave me time to repent. He gave me this, you know, he allowed me to live. He allowed me to continue walking and breathing. And in the next couple of weeks after uh, my accident, uh, I was taken to uh, a hospital outside of in Richmond, Virginia, the VCU teaching hospital. I started reading the Bible in the psych ward. It was the King James version only of the Bible. It was really hard to get through, uh, but I tried. And I just, you know, I had this, this really profound uh, insight realization that regardless of what like the culture wants me to believe concerning, you know, like Christianity, the existence of, existence of God, God does exist. There was something in the way that I survived this accident that for me personally was profound, profound proof, profound truth that God exists and that he's good and that he can be trusted. I, I do have some injuries from my accident. I fractured five vertebrae in my lower back and I have a pretty scary scar across the top of my head. It's a good 13 inches. Um, when I shaved my head uh, two or three years ago, my students thought that I had brain surgery because it's it's kind of big, but those are the visible uh, demonstrations of this you know terrible thing that I did to myself in attempting suicide. But this wonderful gift of grace and mercy that God gave to me and allowing me to survive that attempt. Um, the summer after the accident, I wandered into a Baptist church, heard the gospel preach, gave my life to Jesus. And, you know, started reading the Bible, a, a translation that was a little bit easier to read than the King yeah. James Version. And King James Version is, is beautiful poetry, beautiful poetry. Um, but I, you know, just kept reading the Bible, asking people to, to read with me. And in all sincerity, that summer, when uh, just, you know, really taking great stock of my life and what I want to do with it, I picked up old books that I had read, you know, junior year of high school, my humanities one class with my teachers at Landon, and I picked up the Inferno, and I love the poetry and the imagery, but there was something profound about what Dante was doing, right? To interview people that had made this choice to not repent and to ask them questions about why they did that. And I started thinking about where would Stalin be if Stalin was in the Inferno? Where would Hitler be if Hitler was in the Inferno? Where would he be in these circles here? And then I started thinking, where would I be? If God didn't listen to that prayer and give me time to repent 
And from there, the idea just drew, uh, sorry, from there, the idea just grew. Continual rewrites, writing chapters, researching, writing outlines, you know, in notebooks or in uh, closets and old townhouse in like a in the old house where we used to live but just allowing this idea to grow as far as what what would be the best thing that I could do out of so harrowing a circumstance and I, I think it would be to write a novel that uh, would Lord willing encourage people to 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 see the profound goodness of God even in the midst of profound human struggles well, well thank you for sharing Winston and, and being so vulnerable there and and and, and praise be um but it it, it and I didn't know all the backstory, right? But when I, when you read the book, I mean, it's, it it shows that there's there's a lot of personal, spiritual, psychological, mental investment in in the character of of Evan. It, it shows, and we don't want to we don't want to give it away. But but I encourage you all to to read it. It's not only beautifully written, but um, kind of given the current cultural moment in America. Uh, versus, of course, the Florence of of Dante's time <laughs> period, and so so the, uh, the 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 sins might be universal, but but the application of those sins um, are are a little bit different, and, and certainly more, uh, I guess, applicable to a twenty first century um, reader. So we're, I'm not going to give it away, even though I really want to. Like, and can you believe in in, in the fourth chapter who he interviews? Uh, but you have to find out for yourself by reading the book. But one quick question that I want to want to ask you. Uh, it, it, Dante, of course, had had his Virgil. Uh, talk to us about who 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 Evans who Evans Virgil is, and and why you chose that that literary character. Well, uh, so as you mentioned, Dante has Virgil lead him through the circles of the Inferno, and Virgil was the preeminent poet of of, of the Roman of, of the Roman world, Roman Empire. He writes that great epic, the Aeneid. And Dante really cut his teeth on, on reading poetry, uh, reading uh, Virgil's Aeneid. And so I think for Dante, he had a profound respect for Virgil. And he also saw himself perhaps in that grand literary tradition that went from Homer to Virgil, that Dante, I think, you know, I mean, in my estimation, it goes from uh, Virgil, Virgil to Dante, Dante to Milton, as far as like those really big preeminent poets that write books that really typify the age that they're written in, right? They, you can almost learn everything about the high middle ages and the early Renaissance in Italy by reading Dante's Inferno. The same with reading verses in Aeneid or Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. With my guide, um, I, I thought about this for a long time, but it, it has to be, it had to be Ernest Hemingway. So he, if for any listeners who aren't familiar, uh, Ernest Hemingway is a giant of American literature. Um, his short stories and novels are profound. He's known for inventing a style that's more like journalism, more like newspaper articles. The iceberg theory, he tried to keep his prose uh, relatively simple and stark, but each word is still imbued with in profound meaning as to what uh, Ernest is, is trying to get at. I think as far as American authors, like he's, you know, he may not be the best, but he's definitely in that top five of great American literary figures. Um, beyond that, Ernest Hemingway has profound significance to my own life. Um, I can think of visiting any number of bars that Ernest Hemingway frequented uh, in Terramina, Sicily. I got to go there when I was in college. Uh, there's a number of bars there in Terramina and in Venice that I visited that there are photos of Ernest, you know, there, you know, you know, having conversations with guests. Uh, I went on a really wonderful family trip uh, in high school uh, uh, to Key West and Ernest Hemingway lived there for a time and his house is still there and it's inhabited by uh, just dozens upon dozens of cats that have now taken over the property. And so that personal significance to me, I feel like has that same sort of carryover with Dante and Virgil. On the other hand, there are three things about his life personally that I feel like makes him the ideal guide. Um, one, he was very adventurous. He, he loved going on safari, fishing trips, getting as close to death as he possibly could, indeed studying it in a way that a uh, few other individuals would dare to do. Um, two, uh, he struggled with alcohol addiction in the same mm -hmm. way that I did. He drank pretty copiously throughout the whole of his life. And, uh, and, and like me as well, he committed suicide. And so Ernest, as far as you know, the struggles that I have, the struggles that he had are eerily similar. And in the years uh, uh, 
you know, the years where I was struggling with alcohol, like I was also reading his books and really enjoying the, the prose that he was able to put together, the, the efforts that he could, he could take a hospital stay or a fishing trip and just spin it into literary gold. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that too, there's a profound sadness with his life that I think if he were to tell you on the other side, he would tell you that all the things that he really gave his life for, like his writing, are ultimately not worth it. Um, his, you know, uh, I think wishing that he was a better father, you know, that he spent more time with his kids, that he spent more time pouring into them instead of perhaps chasing literary ambition or honestly the sort of hedonism that, that, that we see running through his life and in my own. Um, if Ernest Hemingway could, could tell you all the things that, that he's learned, you know, down uh, in the inferno, and this is uh, so many of the conversations in the book, you know, he wrote books about, uh, you know, staying in Spain, but he was far away from Spain. He wrote books about growing up in Michigan, but he was in Paris. And so perhaps like he could see the significance of his life and perhaps the emptiness of a lot of the pursuits he gave his life to now that he's on the other side and he's given a, an insight and a perspective that tragically he can't make any use of, but the reader can, if the mm -hmm. reader really imbibes those sorts of lessons and seeks to act on them. Wow. Wow. Amazing. I, I, I visited Ketchum, Ketchum, Idaho, not, not too long ago. And I believe mm -hmm. that's where where he where he where he passed where he committed suicide. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, again, everyone read the book, order the book. It's um, you can order it. Is it Fidelis Publishing? I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's discounted at Fidelis, and that's Fidelis. just faithfultext.com. Cool. Um, right now, there's a uh, actually, actually no, the promo code will probably be gone, but you can. Um, it's available on at online retailers everywhere and discounted at faithfultext.com. Wonderful. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Winston. This was um this was such a delightful and, and just raw and beautiful conversation. Um I do of course have one one last question. We talked a lot about books um uh, already, but as you know, as as a listener of Anchored, uh, I'm gonna ask you about the one text or the one book that has been most impactful in your life. And I'm always saying it almost has to be the Inferno, I guess, but but feel free to, <laughs> to choose a different one. Oh, I do have to go with the Inferno just for yeah. the beauty of, of Dante's imagery and poetry and the influence it's had on my own life. I've read a number of different translations of the book, and I tried to learn medieval Italian so that I could read it in its mm -hmm. original, uh, in, in Dante's original language, but I just couldn't do it. But uh, it, it would have to be that for the impact that it's had on my own life. And I think just the wisdom that still carries through as you read it. You know, Dante really had the same sorts of struggles that you and I have had. You know, like I know our struggles are very different, but there's something very universal in the way that a really great poet like Dante um, is able to to put those down into language so that those words really stretch across the ages. So Wonderful. Dante... I have to go with Milton too for the same reasons, uh, just because yeah. there's so many great lines from Paradise Lost that I still think about and chew over day to day. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Again, we're here with Winston Brady, the director of Curriculum and Thales Press at Thales Academy and the author of Inferno. Winston, thank you so much for joining today. This was, this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Soren. It's been a pleasure.